from GBH Forum Network. This is Footnote. From the moment that the Japanese bombers appeared over Oahu, that was what came to thousands of minds of Japanese American and Japanese residents in Hawaii. When they saw the emblem of the rising sun on the underwings of those aircraft, they knew instantaneously that they had a challenge ahead of them, that they were going to, in some sense or another, have to pick where their, decide where their allegiance lay. Author Daniel Brown talking about the December 7th, 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor. More about that in a moment. So why do we use footnotes? First of all, to reference the sources, and also to add some comments. Hi, I'm Andrew Vanoss, and I will be your host for Footnote, a podcast about everything. Politics, environmental science, mental health, and much more. Thank you for listening, and welcome to Footnote. Daniel James Brown is the author of Facing the Mountain, a true story of Japanese-American heroes in World War II. Brown is well known for his number one New York Times bestseller, The Boys in the Boat. In Facing the Mountain, Brown explores a World War II saga of patriotism and sacrifice featuring Japanese immigrants and their American-born children. On May 12, 2021, the author discussed his book and shared the stories of these immigrants and their families in the years after the attack on Pearl Harbor. The Forum Network presentation was co-sponsored by the New England Historic Genealogical Society American Ancestors, along with the Boston Public Library and the Japan Society of Boston. To help us understand what it was like living in a prison camp and growing up as a perceived enemy of the United States, We've invited Margie Yamamoto to speak with us. Now retired, Miss Yamamoto served as co-president of the New England chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League, a national human rights and educational organization. In Japanese, we have uh, terms that describe the generations that have immigrated to this country. So my parents, my father actually, who came from Japan, he is considered an issei, first generation from another country. My mother, who was born in Hawaii of Japanese parents, she is considered a Nisei, or second generation. These terms are based on the Japanese system of counting, Ichi, Ni, San. So there's Issei, Nisei, Sansei, and then it goes on, Yonsei, Gosei. Uh, There are as many generations as there are numbers. I am a Nisei Han, which is second and a half generation, because my father was an Issei, which would have made me a Nisei, but my mother is a Nisei, which would have made me a Sansei, a third generation. So I'm two and a half generations. Yamamoto was two months old when her family was forced into a detention facility in Arizona. As author Daniel Brown tells in his book, the attack on Pearl Harbor set a new course for Japanese-American families. This book as a whole, as an overall structure, weaves together the stories of their immigrant families, how they coped with the beginning of the war, how they coped with incarceration, how others resisted it, and so sort of the whole fabric of the experience. And Margie's was no exception. Uh, Our family lived in a place called Terminal Island, which was actually an island um, in the Los Angeles Harbor. It was a small island, and about 3,000 Japanese and Japanese-Americans lived on this island. Most of the men were fishermen. They had Many of them had their own fishing boats or worked on other people's boats, and they went out and fished for all the mackerel and tuna that was so plentiful back in those days. The women went to work in the canneries that were on Terminal Island, and my parents opened a grocery store there. That was what we had before the war broke out. And it was a really wonderfully closed community. You could only get to the island on a ferry from San Pedro. It was very, very Japanese in many ways because we celebrated Japanese holidays and had community picnics. And it was, it was a you know, very safe, nice community for the Japanese. Because of where Terminal Island was located, in the Los Angeles Harbor, and to the west 
was a military base, and to the east in Long Beach, they were just starting to build a major naval base. And then, of course, Los Angeles was to the north. And Terminal Island's residents had access to fishing boats. So right after, almost immediately after Pearl Harbor happened, the FBI descended on Terminal Island and began arresting the community leaders and the men who owned fishing boats, which accounted for almost all the men who lived there. My father, before before Pearl Harbor, was um, a ship chandler to Japanese ships that were trading in the port of Los Angeles. The FBI investigated him thoroughly because he was going on and off the Japanese ships. So when the FBI came to arrest all the Japanese men, they just said, oh, Yamamoto's okay. We checked him out already. And they didn't arrest him. So we were so fortunate because at that point there were three kids and my mother was pregnant with me she was eight and a half months pregnant with me at the point. Anyway, so Terminal Island was the first place uh, the FBI came into. As soon as President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, we were also the first person affected by that order because Executive Order 9066 gave the military total jurisdiction over the population of the West Coast states. And... Um, because of Terminal Island's location and the men's access to boats and everything, they came, first came to us and gave us 48 hours to evacuate our homes, businesses, and get off the island. And because they were so disorganized, they hadn't done the next step, which is to provide us transportation, a place to go, just making it Make, giving us the ability to get off of the island in 48 hours. So that was our introduction to the beginning of it. It was a month later that they did a mass evacuation of the rest of the West Coast. That's when they went all the way from, uh, I think, Arizona, all the way up the coast to Washington State, where they then sent out mass evacuation orders. We moved to an apartment in Boyle Heights area of Los Angeles, um, which was right next to Little Tokyo. And my father was watching because they closed down areas of, of the state and moved people into the temporary, uh, they called them relocation centers, because they couldn't build the permanent camps that we went into quickly enough. And so my father would monitor what areas were being closed down. And he would move us to another area and kept us free and out of the camps as long as he could. And eventually we did end up going to Turlock for the uh, relocation center. It became quite evident as I listened to so many different voices of Nisei men in particular, that, that there was not a unified view of what had happened or what should have happened even. There were many different views, but they basically split into two large divisions, which were those who adamantly believed that the right thing to do was to, um, to, to go off to camps, to, to suffer nobly, to, to be as American as they could, and so on and so forth, on the one hand, and to serve in the military if they got the chance. And on the other hand, though, to resist with every fabric, uh, every being part of their fabric that they could summon up. I chose to focus on Gordon as a resistor, partly because he's so well documented and he, he based his arguments so much on carefully laid out principles. But there were also many, many, many young men within the camps in particular, particularly at Heart Mountain and Tule Lake, who resisted ferociously. Hearing all these different voices, it revealed to me how complex the situation was. And that's part of what made it interesting to me. As I say, the sort of impetus, the spring behind the book is dilemmas are always a good thing for a storyteller. And here was this sort of existential dilemma that these young men faced and that their, that their families were affected by it. Of course, it wasn't just the young men, it was their mothers and their sisters and all, all their yeah. relatives who were deeply affected by this. In the camps, many of the resistors were, were 
treat it sometimes as outcasts because they weren't out there showing their loyalty to America and and accepting what was happening to them. And um, yes, there were deep divides, and Tule Lake was where they sent all the people who... Um, there was a loyalty questionnaire that was sent out uh, to everyone over the age of 17. And um, there were two questions in it. One asked if you were willing to serve in the military of services of the United States, uh, you know, under any conditions. And the other one asked, um, essentially, if you uh, uh, renounce your allegiance to any other country. So for the Issei, first generation, if they renounced their allegiance to Japan, they didn't have a country. They couldn't even become an American citizen. So, um, you know, that, that was an unanswerable question in a way. And the one about fighting for the United States, um, the Nisei, the second generation, most of them, you know, were willing to fight. But as I said, some insisted their, their families be released before they would do it. Uh, and others... Um, the Issei could not say yes to that question because they might find themselves fighting against brothers or cousins. And, you know, and most of them were older, too. So um, if you answered no, no to those questions, you were sent to a segregated camp called Tule Lake, which is on the California-Oregon border. border. And, um, and there they were given harsher treatment. And at the end of the war, they were given uh, the option of uh, repatriating to Japan if they wanted to. Some of them did. Everyone who's been in the camps suffered from just the lack of organization and, and, and um, facilities available to, to them. Our own family, we were lucky. By the time we made it to the camp, per, our permanent camp in um, Arizona, Gila River, Arizona, in the middle of nowhere, in a desert area. And we lived in uh, one of the barracks. The barracks were typical military barracks that were divided into housing units. Our housing unit was 20 by 25 feet in size. That, that's where the six of us lived. It was hot, and there were sandstorms. And because they built these barracks with green lumber, the wood shrank in the sun. And there were some sandstorms, so sand would infiltrate all of our living units. In these harsh conditions, the Japanese-American community began to organize themselves. Many of them taught in the schools. They did bring teachers from the outside, but um, many of the, you think about it, Japanese-Americans, they all had a, a wealth of, of uh, professions, uh, doctors, nurses, everything. So it was, it was you know, they were paid, Let's see, professionals like teachers and doctors were paid $19 a month. Semi-professionals like camp cooks, and there are some people who would disagree with you as to the quality of the food, but um, they were paid $16 a month, and uh, manual labor was paid $12 a month. And manual labor would be, um, th they had farms there where they were growing vegetables uh, for our meals and um, mess hall helpers who would clean the tables and, and, and help, you know, organize those things. So there were jobs to be had at the camp. Uh, my father created one of his own. He, because of his work in, in Terminal Island prior to that, he knew a lot of people in the fishing industry who were not Japanese. So they shipped him fish on ice and he sold it to the other people who were in the camp so they could have sashimi. This is Footnote from GBH Forum Network. I'm Andrew Vanoss. Margie Yamamoto gives public talks where she blends her family's personal story with the cultural memory of World War II and its aftermath. She's also an activist on behalf of Asian American civil rights, serving as the past co-president of the New England chapter of the Japanese American Citizens League. In our original Forum Network presentation, sponsored by American Ancestors, the Boston Public Library, and the Japan Society of Boston, 
Writers Roland Keltz and Daniel Brown discuss why Japanese immigrants were treated so much differently than Germans or Italians. Unfortunately, one of the uh, very timely matters in the book is this question of prejudice and uh, particularly that directed against Asian Americans. And as we know, uh, in the U.S., there's been a, a, a rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans recently in the country. And I guess I wanted to sort of look at that issue through the prism of your book, Daniel. You, you, you note a sort of piercing segment of the book as you're following the uh, soldiers as they're training in the South that German Americans and Italian Americans, uh, even though those nations were considered uh, obviously direct enemies of the United States, uh, they were not treated to the same humiliations and to the incarceration that the Japanese Americans faced. And it, obviously it raises this question about whether race itself and the exoticism that, that some humans apply to racial matters can kind of overtake any questions of justice or uh, dignity. I've lived in Boston for over 40 years, and um, I still get asked, where are you from? And at first, I, I was so surprised because I'd been living in California, and no one asked me that kind of question before. I was also asked where I'd learned to speak English so well. And um, it, it was annoying at first because I realized that because I didn't look like them, I was foreign. You know, now, 40 years later, I still get asked that question. I have a friend, um, Paul Watanabe at UMass, Boston. He, he calls it, perpetu we are perpetual foreigners, no matter what we do or how we speak. And it's something that just sort of follows us, but it reminds me that it was that perpetual foreignness that brought us into the camps 80 years ago, because we look different. And then we see it happening with other groups. It doesn't matter whether you're black, whether you're South Asian. If you're different and don't look totally white American, there's a chance something's going to happen. And it, gets, it scares me. I have a friend, a young Asian American woman, who was walking... In, in her town, just a little bit west of Boston. And some car slowed down, and the man spit at her and told her, go back where you came from. I mean, it's horrifying. And that was a town right next door to where I lived. And so far, it hasn't happened to me yet. But any time anyone looks at me twice, I, I start to back away or move away, uh, because uh, it, it's scary. Back in, oh, I don't know, was it the 1960s, somebody came up with this term, model minority. And they said the Japanese in America were the model minority because we came back and were so successful. And that's such a horrible label to put on any people. The Japanese in America are just like any group. Uh, we have our outstanding stars who uh, are successful and wealthy and everything else. We also have those who don't make it, who can't make it, and are still, you know, having troubles and struggling. And, and having to live with a, a title like model minority is really more of a hindrance than a help. And I, I don't hear it anymore so much. But uh, that's what just that comment just triggered that in my mind. We are no longer a model minority. We are not a model minority. We have our troubles just like everyone else. And, and, and we're as American as everyone else. Eventually, the internment camps were closed, and Margie Yamamoto's family expected to resume life as American citizens. But as forum moderator Roland Keltz explained, the transition came with much trauma. In Japanese culture and a lot of Asian cultures, uh, there's this concept of shame, which is quite different than the way it's often perceived in the West and certainly in the United States. And so the idea of talking about this conflict between those who 
readily volunteered to go fight for the United States and to defend those constitutional principles. And those who resisted, uh, because in fact, the United States had incarcerated them and their families and disenfranchised them, taken away their livelihoods, their businesses, their, uh, and in, in many ways, their dignity. My father never talked to me about how he felt about Japan versus the United States. But I do know there was some residual feelings with his distrust of things white and American. It, it went throughout my childhood, and I could see it in, in ways that were difficult on the family. For example, my brother who was a student body president in his high school and went on to any town USA where he was the mayor. He was offered a full scholarship to any college he wanted to by one of the patrons of any town USA. My father refused to let him go. He says, what does he want from you? My father was a very traditional Japanese man. He spoke mostly Japanese at home because my mother spoke Japanese and English, so she could be the go-between for any any discussions needed. And um, I had been looking for books on on the incarceration that were translated into Japanese for him. And I did find one book, and this is this had to be about 1972 or three. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, it was 75 that I found the book. And um, it was, it, it talked about the incarceration and the injustice of it and everything. He read the book and then he said to me in Japanese, please get me more books like this. And I realized at that point he'd never seen anything before in writing that he could read easily that told him what happened to him was unjust. Unfortunately, that was a book I got him for his 75th birthday, and he died before his 76th birthday, and I still couldn't, at that point, I couldn't find any more books. Uh, But uh, I figure he knows. He knows it happened. But in the end, it's really, it's a story of courage more than anything else. And not just the courage that these young soldiers showed on the battlefield, but different dimensions of courage, including the courage of somebody like Gordon Hirabayashi, who stood up to the authorities and defied the curfew and the exclusion laws. And the courage of the family members who stood by these young men, whether they were fighting in courtrooms or fighting overseas in Italy, France, and Germany. In my family, there was no one of draft age. Uh, My father was a 42-year-old adult man, and all the kids were under the age of nine. So we didn't face the dilemma of of serving in the uh, military or not. But, But many, many young men who were college age and teenagers um, face that dilemma. I guess whenever I hear about the 442nd, I think about a dear friend of ours, uh, Susumi Ito, who was with the 442nd. And, And his modesty about all he went through during World War II. Um, He was part of the group that rescued the Texas um, unit in France and um, where so many of his his fellow uh, soldiers were killed. And he talks about, he talked about how, you know, he was just lucky that he came out alive. And, but he never, he never went on and on about his courage going into, into battle. Uh, he was just so modest about it all. And that's what impressed me so much. And he was such a wonderful, dear person. He, he was raised on a farm in California. And, and if the war hadn't broken out, he probably would have stayed in the farm in California because there were no opportunities. But thanks to the GI Bill and some other opportunities, he ended up on the, um, I believe he was teaching at um, Harvard Medical 
uh, but he was just an absolutely wonderful person. And, and that's who comes to mind whenever I hear about the 442nd and all the wonderful things they did and, and the incredible things they did. Near the end of his second term, President Ronald Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, providing reparations to surviving Japanese Americans and a formal apology for their incarceration during World War II. However, Miss Yamamoto continues to call her public lectures justice denied. The only people who got the money were people who were still alive, so my father never got any money. And um, does it absolve it? It softens it. I don't think it absolves them from anything they did. Um, and also, we were talking about how different the Japanese, how different people in the community are. There are people, Japanese Americans, who refuse the money and uh, were against reparations. And uh, I'd say the majority accepted it because it was nice. Um, I'm not sure how it was spent, but I know in our family, a portion of it went to the Japanese American National Museum that was just getting started in Los Angeles. And um, so we gave a share of our money to that. And, and of course, save some of it to play with ourselves. But uh, when my mother was paid, a couple of months after she received her check, we went to visit her. And I was curious, so I just said, Mom, what you do with the money? And she just sort of motioned to me. And in her house, she's got a Buddhist altar. And on a Buddhist altar, you always put pictures of deceased relatives. So ours has a picture of Dad. So she takes me to the altar, and there, resting against Dad's picture, is her uncashed check. She just wanted to be sure he knew. We finally convinced her to put the check in the bank and to make a Xerox copy. We made a Xerox copy of the check for her so she could put it next to Dad's picture. You know, I think the best part of the reparations bill that they passed was that they also included education. As a result, some of the sites where we had our camp have education centers now, and, and they've made it a location where you can go and find out what happened. And that was the best part of it. I know that the subject was taught at least minimally in California. When I was a kid, we all read Farewell to Manzanar, um, which you know, made a big impression on me. Um, but you know, when my kids were going to school, I don't recall this being a subject at all um, yeah. in their schooling, and they went to good schools on the West Coast. So there's certainly a need, and particular, particularly given this sort of outburst of, of hate and revisionist history, there really is a, a deep need for young people to, um, to be made familiar with this story. I think part of what happened was that um, Nisei, uh, men and women, when they came out of the camps, they often didn't want to talk about it, even with their own children. And so the, the stories sort of, they didn't disappear, but they got buried under several layers of, or several decades of silence. And in many ways, they're just sort of reemerging now as, as Sansei and subsequent generations are more interested in delving back into that history. Every time I share my story and I talk to the people who have listened, I find that uh, I think one or two or three or more people have understood what I was saying about it goes beyond the Japanese American story. It's any new American story, anyone coming into this country, and people who have been in this country for hundreds of years, too. And just because of the color of our skin or the fact that our eyes might look a little different, there seems to be situations where um, we are treated differently and not equally. So I'll keep giving, telling my story to anyone who asks, 
and um, hopefully there'll be more people listening. Thank you for listening to Margie Yamamoto's story and her reflections on our Forum Network and American Ancestors presentation, Facing the Mountain, with Daniel Brown and Roland Kelts. You can view the talk on our website, forum-network.org, and our YouTube channel is where you can listen to this and all our footnote episodes. This episode of Footnote was produced by Dave Goodman and Frederic Rigolo, who interviewed our guest, Margie Yamamoto. Thank you so much, Margie, for joining us today in the GBS studio. Thank you for inviting me. Dave Goodman is our audio engineer and sound designer. Annie Schreffler is our executive producer. And I'm host and producer, Andrew Vanoss. Footnote is a project of the Forum Network. We're grateful to the Lowell Institute for their financial support of this program and listeners like you. Our website is forum-network.org, where you'll find all our talks from the past 15 years. If you've seen or heard a talk you would like us to further explore, send your requests to forum underscore network at wgbh.org. We appreciate you listening, and please come back for another episode of Footnote.